Education, as a fundamental human right, is an inherently democratic ideal. The word democracy comes from the ancient Greek demos, meaning common people, and kratos, meaning power. And throughout history, it's been a pretty universally recognized concept that knowledge is power. It is precisely our universal education system and the free exchange of this knowledge that has propelled our human society forward at a pace unimaginable to our ancestors. But the double-edged sword of this accelerated pace of change brought on by modern technologies is that our modern world is leaving the majority of people behind, creating a widening gap between the new knowledge elites and everyone else. We've all seen the news. We're in the middle of a technological revolution. The internet is all around us, and yet it feels untrustworthy. Millions and millions of people are being told that in the future of work, they need to reskill in order to remain relevant, or that robots might take their jobs. Even those of us with university educations now find ourselves in a rapidly evolving and uncertain workplace that we were not prepared for. When online courses debuted in 2011, they purported to be a solution to all of these problems. By giving the keys to elite education to anyone with an internet connection, massive open online courses, or MOOCs, promised to democratize knowledge once and for all. The only problem is, nearly a decade later, that hasn't happened. Research compiled by the International Council for Open and Distance Learning shows that of all the people who have ever completed an online course, over 80% already hold a university degree, that men outnumber women at 56%, and that amongst individual subjects, such as STEM, the typical gender divide still exists online. Now, for those of you who work in higher education or online education, these statistics are nothing new. But when these topics are discussed, blame is typically placed on the very notion that it's impossible to reach or engage with people off campus, and that any sort of ed tech solution that purports to be able to do this should be met with skepticism. But what I would like to argue today is that traditional institutions and online course platforms have actually not attempted to adapt tertiary education to the needs of our hectic modern lifestyles, let alone on attracting typically marginalized groups, and that doing so can make all the difference. What I'm working on now with my team at Reactor is to rethink online education using human-centered design thinking. That may sound like something a little bit out of the box, but actually, most of the products that we know and use today were done with design thinking. So why not online education? As a very basic principle, design thinking means to understand, empathize with, and to find your end user ahead of designing the concept and build of your product. Then, everything about your product, from why it exists, to what it consists of, to how it is delivered, and how it adapts to ongoing feedback is centered around considering the needs and experiences of your users. Imagine for the moment the background of a typical person looking to upskill or reskill online, or even somebody who's just looking to gain a general understanding of a topic that they've had no prior background in. Regardless as to their prior educational attainment, they are very likely to be time poor whether they're job seeking, working full time, or taking care of family. They also most likely belong to the 80% of Europeans who access the internet primarily on their mobile phones, mostly using just a few of their familiar applications. For this person, online education needs to be bite-sized, easily digestible, approachable in tone and feel, and most importantly, mobile friendly. It also helps if it's fun, bringing online education into where it actually happens in most people's lives, their free time. The vast majority of online courses today were designed for full-time university students, and they are delivered in tone and format to those already familiar with and majoring in their subject areas. But what about the rest of us? What about the over 200 million people between the ages of 25 and 65 in Europe and the US alone who do not hold a university degree? What about people like me, with an educational background in the humanities, a perspective so desperately needed in technology today? Where do we go to feel like there's content for us? And how can we all work together to 
close the diversity gap in education in areas like gender, socioeconomic background, and region. In recent years, the knowledge gap in technology especially has grown even wider and faster than ever before. We are starting to understand on a societal level the consequences that this can have on everything from creating inclusive technologies to maintaining trust in our democracies to future-proofing our economies. Like many others, my career journey to work in tech was not a linear narrative. In my quest to translate the world around me into a language that I could understand, I had the great fortune to come across and now join a project that is redefining the space of online learning. My team at Reactor Education teamed up with the University of Helsinki to create a free online course called Elements of AI. And now, two and a half years on, it's become somewhat of a global phenomenon. Artificial intelligence is like electricity. It will shape our world in ways that we are just now imagining. So our idea was a simple, democratic one. If AI, like knowledge, is power, then it should not be left in the hands of a few elite coders. But how do you go about taking a subject at the cutting edge of computer science and putting it in the hands of citizens just coming to terms with digital literacy? Working with Professor Temurus at the University of Helsinki, we combined world-class education with design thinking to create a course on the basics of AI specifically aimed at people who are typically left out of technology discussions. We gathered focus groups from our target demographics and asked them how they felt about the subject and the way in which it is delivered. We were told that AI is elitist, confusing, and intimidating. That they were oversaturated by information and they didn't know where to go to get clear, concise explanations with practical real-world examples that anyone could understand. Understanding not just the subject, but the delivery, we were able to build a product with a user experience that is intuitive, just like the other apps and websites that people are familiar with in their daily lives. We did all of this with a mobile-first build so that our students could take the course on their bus ride to work. We worked with copy editors and designers to make sure that our content was conversational and that our graphics are inviting and approachable. And as anyone who has ever created a digital product will tell you, it's not enough just to create something and put it online, expecting people to find it. The same goes with online education, particularly if you are trying to attract typically marginalized groups who feel left out of that space. Ahead of launching the course, we set a public challenge for ourselves and anyone who would join us to educate 1% of Finland's population on the basics of AI. It started with a local social media campaign called the AI Challenge that grew after we threw a public ceremony for all of our first graduates, hosted by the president of Finland. Our growth since has been completely organic, spurred on by grassroots movements amongst our students and our global partners all aiming to educate people in their areas who would otherwise be left out of the AI conversation. With our course, we have reached everyone from presidents to prisoners to retirees. For us, inclusivity means building online education for students that other classrooms leave behind. Now featured in over 500 media outlets around the world, the OECD has cited elements of AI as one of the reasons Finland will succeed in the 21st century. We are working now to expand this model globally with local partners and hope to encourage others through our success to form similar collaborations connecting people and technology. After exceeding our goal of educating 1% of Finland's population on the basics of AI, we partnered with the Finnish Office of the European Presidency and the European Commission to translate elements of AI into every official European language, the first course online to do so. We are now currently rolling this course out to every EU country, forming partnerships on the ground with governments, universities, and local organizations to make sure that this course gets in the hands of the people who need it most. And now, over two years later, we have over 540,000 students globally, but most importantly, over 40% of those students are women, more than double the average of every other computer science course online. Looking back, 
the partnership that we formed between a private sector technology firm and a public sector university was an important catalyst in helping us to rethink online education. And the relationships that we have formed since with our local partners have shown us that truly democratizing learning is a collaborative effort both on and offline. It may seem like a daunting task, but there are so many groups of people underrepresented in the space of online education that it is enough to just get started by listening to those you want to reach most. If you were able to consider the daily realities of your target students, how might you rethink your approach? There's clearly no one-size-fits-all silver bullet here. But if knowledge is power, how and with whom we choose to share it will be the defining feature of our future society. I hope today at least that I've inspired some of you to join us in designing for a truly democratic one. Thank you.